Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Gail Giraud, who is a senior researcher at the Center for Scientific Research in Paris. He is about to be the founder and leader of the Georgetown University Center for Environmental Justice. He is also, I'm glad to say, a member of the Commission on Global Economic Transformation that is founded and administered by the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Gil, thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for giving me the floor. Well, your work for the, the Global Commission was it mid, it was in midstream, and many of the themes that I have uh, come to understand through knowing you seem now to be, how we say, more intense and more vivid as we talk on the 14th of May, and the pandemic has made very, very profound changes in the, the nature of our understanding of world, world systems, the role of governments, and the, what you might call shortcomings unmasked in a highly efficient, just-in-time global private sector. As you look at this world, how has it changed your perceptions? And what do you see being done well? And particularly, I know because you're in you're in Dublin now, but you're in Europe. How do you see how the pandemic is affecting countries like Italy, France, Ireland, and the UK? Well, I would say, I mean, there are two levels. Um, I could answer at two levels. The first one is the, let's say the the surface and the political issue. Many European countries have had a very bad reaction to the pandemic. They didn't prepare themselves. They didn't have any strategic plan like Taiwan, South Korea, or Vietnam, so that they were rapidly overwhelmed by the pandemic. Hence, the, the consequences in terms of the death tolls and uh, also the, the need to lock down the economies with the terrifying consequences that this has today. Um, of course, there are some exceptions. I mean, Iceland, for instance, um, began to test one month before the first case, the first positive case, uh, came in the, on the island. Malta also had a very good, very good strategy against the pandemic, and to a certain extent, Germany and, and Netherlands and Sweden also had a good strategy. But Italy, France, the UK, um, Spain definitely have a have had the, the need to implement the medieval reaction, which is the lockdown, because they were entirely overwhelmed. <clears throat> so I guess this will uh, create a huge debate in these countries about the need to reinforce the public health system, with, of course, a number of people saying, no, no, it's exactly the opposite. We should now destroy the, the public health system because we have made a proof that it's inefficient and we should privatize everything. This debate is already occurring today in France, and I'm sure it will be very... <laughs> very harsh in the coming uh, weeks and, and, and months in many European countries. So this is, to, let's say, the surface. Beneath the surface, it seems to me there is a big challenge which is uh, uh, raised by, the, by this crisis, which is the fact that, I mean, mainstream economics being built on the idea that everything is at equilibrium to begin with cannot deal with this kind of problem where we have a big crisis, where we both have a collapse of the supply side and the demand side at the same time. And it's very hard to think about it in terms of an equilibrium model. So that's why it seems to me, I mean, this pandemic opens a big window for, non, for non-orthodox for uh, alternatives, <clears throat> like, you know, dynamical systems uh, used in microeconomic theory in order to try to deal with this complexity of an economy, which is certainly not at equilibrium and which now, in many European countries, but also in the US, unfortunately. If it's going to an equilibrium, it might probably be a, a debt deflationary equilibrium <clears throat> in the sense of, uh, you know, Irving Fischer and Hyman Minsky. So a very bad equilibrium. So, uh, yeah, from this viewpoint, paradoxically enough, I mean, the pandemic might be a good opportunity for the academic sphere in economics to get rid of the mainstream paradigm and to start something new. So let's let's talk about the questions related to uh, global supply chains. Yeah. What what has happened? I mean, obviously, 
when there is a system that's highly integrated and operating on very thin margins, and that system comes apart, in this case for health protection, yep. uh, it, it creates short-term, what I'll call inelasticity, scarcities, and it, it's not responsive. Are we now in a place where this is a one-time episode and we suffered the consequences? Are we in a place now where people are going to want to do the equivalent of self-insurance by localizing, relocalizing, I think is the phrase you've used, uh, yeah. production so that the depth and duration of the suffering that we could contingently incur is diminished in each region of the world? Yeah, this debate is raging today in many countries in Europe. And I'm in, clearly in favor of, of relocalization of our industry, at least in countries like France, where, as you know, industry is just amounts to 12% of the GDP, the same in the UK or in Italy. Um, well, my answer would be it's obvious that this pandemic is not a one-shot big uh, you know, black swan that will never come back in the sense that first it might turn into a seasonary, a seasonary uh, uh, pandemic in case the virus would mutate and come back. Second, there will be other um, pandemics due to the erosion of biodiversity. Let's say, for instance, the deforestation. The deforestation is bringing human beings close to wild animals against which we have no immunology and no way to protect ourselves. In the same way, the, the, the markets in Wuhan for wild animals are make, bringing us closer to these, to these animals. So there will be other pandemics. And more generally, um, climate change and the erosion of biodiversity will most probably provoke the same kind of big problems at the international level in the coming years and decades. So definitely, it seems to me we have to rethink the way we have organized globalization in the last 40 years, which, as you said, was based on, on big supply chains with no stocks and very thin margin in order to maximize profit in the short run. So we are just making the experience that this is not resilient at all against any kind of, of exogenous shock like this pandemic and that we definitely need to rethink it in another way and from my viewpoint to, to relocalize part of our industry. Of course, this raises huge problems um, in the sense that in many sectors, um, <clears throat> the, the, the question is that in many in many European countries, we don't have the labor forces, the qualified labor forces that could work in the same way as some people in other in southern countries, in the, in the globalized southern countries, uh, would work today in these big supply chains. So this will probably increase the labor cost for a number of industries and create a, a, a huge number of macroeconomic problems um, in the future. But I don't see any escape route. The, the, the status quo would mean that we would be very fragile and non-resilient against shocks that will occur most probably in the near future. I remember uh, in preparing for this, I read uh, a very vivid statement that came out in an article you wrote recently uh, on uh, starting anew after COVID-19. And uh, you said that preventing events like a pandemic is not profitable in the short term. Hence, no provisions were made for mass tests or tests to be carried out massively. Yeah. We've reduced hospital capacity in the name of the ideology of demand, dismantling public services, which is now showing itself for what it is, an ideology that kills. Yeah. Now, that's a strong statement, but that seems to be quite an accurate statement. Why did, yeah. why did society get into a place where it convinced itself that cutting all of these public services to the bone was the right path? Well, you know, it seems to me, to a certain extent, I mean, the neoliberal ideology has convinced a number of people, including a number of high civil servants, that the state is definitely uh, something inefficient, that um, deregulated markets should be much more efficient and that we should delegate to markets uh, as much as possible the entire society, I mean, all, all the processes in the society. Um, the point is that at the same time, uh, we did not realize that most of these industries have fixed costs that cannot be taken into account by the private sector. As we know, even from the, the most orthodox neoclassical economic theory, 
um, as soon as an economy a sector, of, let's say, a company has fixed costs, then then you can't just assume that it's going to maximize its profit in the short run because it makes no sense if you have non-convex production. So to a certain extent, what we have done is that we have asked the state to pay for the fixed cost, and then the sector, the private sector, would that just take benefit from the the convex part of the production function. And this doesn't work in the situation where we are now, simply because the pandemic shows that if you privatize health, the health system, then it, 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 there will be a cost for that. I mean, and there will be poor people unable to pay this cost, this, this price, the price um, of the health, the sanitary system. And these people, of course, will convey the virus to the others, even the richest, who could have afforded to have a, a good health system. So the best way to, to remain healthy is for the rich to pay for a public system for the poor. I don't, I don't see any alternative to that. But, but I must confess at the same time that the way the debate is is organizing is organized today in many many Western countries go, partly goes in the opposite direction, saying, as I said earlier, I mean the public system of health system is very bad and we should get rid of it and privatize any, any everything, which is a pure nonsense. Well, I think it's a nonsense that. Uh comes from a lot of different directions. The deification of markets is almost like there's some divine arbiter in markets that uh, allocates or fulfills the wishes of people magically. One of the problems in markets is when you're poor, you may have what economists call preferences, but you have no demand function. You got to have money to be heard by Mm -hmm. the market. Secondly, this is the, what I call the demonization of governance. Everything it does is a, a dimension of inefficiency. Well, I, I find this very problematic, particularly in the country where I live, the United States. There is a former musician and artist who once appeared on a blog named Stuart Zeckman. Mm-hmm. And he pointed out in this blog post, which I'll be happy to put online uh, associated with this episode, was that this division between markets and government, good and bad, in the United States is a false consciousness. Yeah. And when you go to the Gallup polls in the United States, why do people think government is bad? Because they think wealthy people and large concentrated corporate interests control the government to subsidize themselves at the expense of the taxpayer. So Mm, it's not one is an efficient mechanism and the other is a uh, clumsy or error prone mechanism. It's that the power of the neoliberal vision in markets has commodified the appointments of politicians who in the United States depend on tremendous amount of fundraising the making of laws, the making of regulations, the public relations, the appointments, the enforcement, and all of these things lead to what, after the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, which spawned Occupy Wall Street on the left, Tea Party on the right, and a change in control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, what was called the mother of all moral hazards. And I guess as I look at the uh, structure of central bank-centered fiscal assistance, I think many people are going to be concerned that all of those who were doing stock buybacks, running on very thin margins, or banks speculating aggressively, were doing so because they thought they had the political muscle to use contingent fiscal capacity to bail themselves out. Mm -hmm. because of their influence in the government and leave the people, the broad population, out to the side. There's a gentleman named Ian Welsh in America who has has just written a blog post, which I'll put up also with this, called uh, How Neoliberalism Has Destroyed Capitalism. And he basically talked about how all the small businesses are going out of business And all the big airlines and big private equity companies and big financial institutions are being fortified. And the stock market is not in disaster when the economy is. 
So yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think we're in a very confused state, and and I did this long winded preface in the uh, in the spirit of asking you a question. There's a very dangerous fork in the road now between authoritarian response and reinvigoration yeah. of democratic representation. And uh, how do you see how we're going to restore? the integrity, faith, and trust in expertise, the integrity, faith, and trust in public service, when the episode screams at us that we are not providing adequate public goods in many places in the world, most noticeably the United States and the UK. Well, <clears throat> I, I definitely agree with you that there is a big risk of shifting towards authoritarian regimes actually this monster that would be an authoritarian neoliberal state. Um, and to a certain extent, even France is slowly going in this direction in the sense that the state of emergency um, looks like an alibi in order to, um, to implement, um, you know, a, a police that is much more, much more uh, inquiring about what the private life of people that it, as it did earlier. Same story in a number of European countries. Um, I would say, you know, in equal to what you just said, um, ju just a few remarks. The first one is you spoke about the deification of markets. I totally agree. And that's a paradox in the sense that <clears throat> even if you look at the most orthodox neoclassical economic theory, namely general economic theory, it's known since more than, more than 40 years, actually, since the 80s, that um, incomplete financial markets are always or almost always inefficient and deeply inefficient. They are not even second best efficient. So that's a product that at the same time in the 80s, you had people like John Janakopoulos or Andrew Maskolon proving, mathematically speaking, that uh, incomplete markets are inefficient. And even that, even if you, you have some financial innovation in the sense that you add a new financial derivative, then this does not necessarily reduce the inefficiency of markets. Um, this is a beautiful result by Ronald Ellul in the 90s. And at the same time, in most Western business schools, you would find people teaching, you know, that financial markets are efficient, uh, that they know everything, that they predict everything, and that um, we should just rely entirely on them. So this is a, this is a big paradox. The, the second remark I would like to make, to make is that, um, yeah, I totally agree with you that the, the alternative, the dilemma between the, the state on the one hand and the market on the other hand is quite simplistic in the sense that, um, you know, it's an heritage of the old uh, dichotomy inherited from law between between the public and the private. But as was shown by, by uh, Eleanor Ostrom, there are a number of other categories of goods and services, and for instance, the commons. And, and this provides me... Uh, an answer to, to your last question, which is uh, what would be the road towards an alternative um, from the authoritarian neoliberal state? Uh, the, the authoritarian neoliberal state is a way to combine the state, actually to capture the state, that is the public instance in the society, uh, to, to make it serve some private interests. And that's, to my, from my viewpoint, the essence of, of neoliberalism, which, is, which has nothing to do with the liberal project, of, of uh, the political liberal project of enlightenment in the 18th century, which was to protect people from tyranny thanks to the law. So ne neoliberalism does exactly the opposite. It captures the state, it captures the law, the public instance, in order to force it as to serve some private interest, um, serving a minority of people. Now, the, the, the project, the political and social project of the commons goes exactly in the, in the other direction, saying everything depends upon the, the resources that we want to, um, to manage and to deal with, and of which we want to take care as a community, and that we want to turn into a commons. That is, it, it, mean, it means that there must be a community which invents uh, its own rules in order to take care of a commons, be it let's say, uh, a free software, be it uh, education, be it the money, the money could be viewed as a commons, be it even labor. Why should labor be considered as a private commodity, um, which is exchanged on a market? Um, and why not as a commons, which take part to an interesting project, um, socially useful, uh, embodied in a company? Um, and also, of course, that you're, of course, ecological ecosystems, uh, ecosystemic services could also be viewed as, as commons. Um, and by saying this, of course, I'm, I'm referring to Karl Polanyi's 
a famous uh, trilogy, um, the Earth, Ecological Ecosystemic Services, and um, Money, and, and uh, Labor. So this opens a huge, a huge research program, which is both um, intellectually fascinating um, and politically very, um, I think, uh, very revolutionary. It's consistent saying, well, we need a third, a third party in the in the old dilemma between the market and the state, namely the civil society, which creates commons. To give you an example, when I was the, the chief economist of the French Development Bank, I served there for five years. Um, uh, uh, we discovered that actually in a number of situations, if you help communities on the ground organize themselves in order to take care, let's say, of water as a commons, this is much more efficient than privatizing the water or than asking the state, the bureaucratic state, to take care of water. Let me just give you an example. In um, 2016, actually, um, La Paz in Bolivia, <clears throat> which is one of the two captains of Bolivia, as you know, and which is located very high at 4,000 meters high. La Paz had a big problem with, um, with water, the distribution of water, and namely La Paz went through uh, what is called the day zero during the summer. That is the, the day where you don't have water on tap, which as you know is, is, a, is a very complicated situation for many people. Um, so that this means that rich people in the center of the city didn't have any access to drinkable water, but at the same time, poor people in the suburbs of La Paz, which had organized themselves in order to deal with water as a commons, they still had water during the whole summer. So they didn't suffer from this uh, terrifying situation where you don't have any, any access to drink of the water. And this, it seems to me, I mean, this is the way we understood it at the French Open Bank. This is a very fascinating example of the fact that actually taking care of a number of resources as a commons is much more efficient than trying uh, to privatize it or to ask the, the state to take care of it. Of course, water is just one example, but we could also think of, as I said earlier, a number of other other issues. So, you know, they're not to be too long. Let me also give you an ex another example, which is money. We could read, you know, the, the experiment of the Eurozone in Europe as a way actually to privatize money uh, in the sense that the European Central Bank doesn't have any political counterpart to which it should talk in order to make a decision. Uh, that's the, the famous dogma of the independence of the Central Bank, um, which I believe doesn't have any analytical support. Um, e even from a purely orthodox viewpoint, because, I mean, asking the central bank to be independent from the political power means that money should be neutral um, in the sense that the quantity of money circulating in an economy doesn't have any impact on the macroeconomic variables of the economy, except the level of prices, the absolute level of prices, which is the, the standard quantitative monetary theory. But as you know, this is entirely wrong. Empirically speaking, we never observe money neutrality, be it in the short or the medium run or even the long run, um, which means it makes no sense to disentangle fiscal policy from monetary policy. But nevertheless, we have done it in the, European, in the, in the Eurozone so that the ECB today is on its own to make decision, um, which means actually the ECB is talking to the private sector. And those who really have the power to create money without having to rely on the state in, in, the, in the economy, these are the private banks. So to a certain extent, we have privatized money in the Eurozone. Now the question is, is there an alternative? So if you think of the, the classical dilemma between the state and the market, you would say, well, the alternative is to increase the, the reserve requirement from one person as it, in, as it is today in the Eurozone to 100%, which means then that the ECB would decide directly what type of credit, credit private banks could uh, emit or not, which to a certain extent would mean that the ECB would have the total control on money creation through credit. But I don't believe this would be the necessarily the good, the good answer. There is an alternative to this dilemma, which is money as a commons. And all the complementary monies, I mean, uh, currencies and, and that are created everywhere in Europe or in Latin America or in Africa today, um, I don't know yet about the U.S., but probably it's also occurring in the U.S. As an example, are, are all examples of communities that try to recover some power on the money creation. So they create their own money on their own and they manage it in the way they want to do it. So they may have artificial inflation uh, because they do believe that this is a good thing. This, this forces people 
to, to transact with money and not to try to keep it at home. And there are some very successful stories, as you know. I mean, in, in Sardinia, for instance, in the south of Italy, you have the so-called Sardex, which is one example of a complementary money, uh, whose volume of transaction each year per annum is uh, one, uh, one trillion euros. So that's a lot of money. Um, and so this is an example. And it seems to me that's the real alternative to the authoritarian neoliberal state that might emerge from this big pandemic. Yeah. By the way, I note uh, Raghu Rajan wrote a book recently, the former, uh, he's a professor at Chicago Business School and a former uh, Indian central bank yeah. governor called The Third Pillar. And it yeah. sounded very, very similar when you said in between the state and the government, there's a, a, the third pillar in his mind was that local society. Yeah, exactly. But I think I think it's fascinating to me, you know, you're talking about water. I come from Detroit, Michigan, and yeah. uh, around the Great Lakes and the bankruptcy of Detroit, the Flint water crisis. I mean, is it not absurd that at the time of the Detroit bankruptcy, they were cutting off the water for poor people and trying to sell the uh, Detroit Water and Sewage, which is the largest freshwater yeah. uh, public utility in the world, to a private French company actually called Suez, yeah, yeah. so that they could then not have to pay the pensions of all the workers because you you had to pay public pensions, but if you privatized, then there would be a windfall. And at the same time, in Flint, Michigan, which is about two baseball throws away from Lake Huron, yeah. which is an enormous body of very high quality fresh water, they managed to pollute the children with lead in the entire society. So it's it's almost like we didn't see the warnings yeah, yeah. in Michigan and, and I'm sure in many, many other places of how this system is is how would I say, doing something monetary that is different than providing value through service. Mm. But I, I, uh, I also am very intrigued because you were talking about money and you're talking about the privatization money, central banks, the yeah. relationship with the state. Prior to the onset of the pandemic, you were doing, I mean, you have been doing, but many people were building a great momentum towards what we might call the Green New Deal, yeah. a monetary financed fiscal expansion that would invigorate aggregate demand and transform the structure of energy on planet Earth in ways to make our environment sustainable. And obviously, it was a global project and it required collaboration between all many, many countries, but particularly the EU, the United States, China, and India, and Japan. How do you see now where people are disoriented by the pandemic, where using a tremendous amount of fiscal capacity to address that challenge, how do you see the prospects for resuming the call to action? to address climate sooner rather than later. Mm. It seems to me there will there is already a, a big, um, how should I say this, argument between, on the one hand, a number of people in the civil society saying, well, we can't, we don't want to resurrect the old world um, after the, the lockdown um, and after the pandemic. So we need to take uh, this opportunity to, to accelerate the transition towards uh, a society based on renewable energies and and protecting and taking care of the the ecological services, and on the other hand, you have a number of people, including some political leaders, um, including in France, uh, who are saying saying exactly the opposite. Namely, you know, we are going to have a lot of unemployment, probably something like twenty five percent of of jobless people. Um, the unique way to, to provide them with jobs really rapidly is to resurrect the old world because we don't know how to do uh, differently from that. And, um, and at the same time, we have a huge public debt. I mean, just to take the example of France, I mean, the public debt of France was 98% uh, uh, of the GDP uh, before the pandemic and probably it's going to jump to 115 
Uh, Italy is probably going also to jump to 160, maybe even more than that. And probably financial markets would then just say, well, you have a public debt problem, as usually. Um, and then this will serve as an alibi to say, well, we have to reduce public spending and we don't, we don't, we can't afford to finance something like a Green New Deal, uh, which would be just catastrophic. But this would mean that uh, we are once again losing time. Uh, as you probably know, the last simulations that are run by some climatologists from IPCC and some friends of mine tend to show that just before the pandemic, um, we were running not just on the most pessimistic scenario of the IPCC, which is the RCP 8.5, as you know, which leads us somewhere between plus four and plus five degrees um, of increase of average temperature on Earth at the end of the century. But we were even above that. So we, I mean, because there was an acceleration of global warming in the last, in the past few years. Um, so not taking this opportunity to implement a Green New Deal would just be catastrophic and would probably bring us back to this very, I mean, to the, this business as usual uh, scenario, which is um, very frightening. Um, at the same time, of course, we have to find solutions um, in order to, to, to provide some funding uh, ways, I mean, to, 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 to provide some ways to fund the Green New Deal in the near future. My viewpoint, and this is what I tried to, to emphasize in the, in the last debates we had in Europe, is that we should think about cancelling part of the public debt of a number of countries, including in the Eurozone. I know that this is a taboo today, but, but actually, if you think about it, I mean, the, the ECB in the last uh, five years bought something like two trillion of euros of public debt from uh, sovereign countries in the Eurozone. For France, this is 400 billion euros. This debt now is in the balance sheet of the ECB. Suppose we cancel it, what's happening? Actually, nothing. I mean, this does not prevent the ECB from, from creating money. And there is a report that has been published by the, the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland, which shows that a central bank can perfectly work and, does, and do his, its job with no equity at all or with negative equity. So the equity of the ECB today is just uh, something like 80 billion euros. That's nothing. So it's not the equity of the ECB that provides credibility to the euro. I mean, that's just a fairy tale. So um, so that's what provides credibility, credibility to the euro is the, the fact that the eurozone is a wealthy economic area. Um, and then the best way to save the euro is, on the contrary, to implement the Green New Deal. Um, and certainly not to say to say, oh, we we don't do it. we can't do anything because we have to to save the, the equity of the ECB. So so if we were to cancel the the public debt of the eurozone countries, which is in the balance sheet of the of the ECB, I mean nobody would lose any money. No private actor would lose anything. The ECB would make a big loss, but that's life. And in the European treaties, it's not even written that countries would be forced to recapitalize the ECB. So we could just live with it, and this would save a lot of a lot of money and give a lot of freedom in terms of you know fiscal freedom for a number of countries. So for France, it would be something as I said, like four hundred billion euros. That's a lot of money, and with this, you could easily finance a big Green New Deal in the next in the, in the next decade. Um, there is a small debate in this direction now in a number of countries, but of course, as you can imagine. As I said, this is entirely taboo, and a number of people in Germany and Netherlands will just be um, really shocked <laughs> if this happens one day. But I'm, but you know, thinking about it, I, I truly believe that if the alternative is between this and it is non-orthodox measure, and on the on the one hand, and on the other hand, a big depression worse than the one we had in the 30s during 10 days, I definitely choose the first option. In the, uh, how would I say, uh, process of the Green New Deal, I feel like we're, uh, we're, we're suffering a little bit from what I mentioned earlier, the lack of faith in credibility in government. Yeah. We're suffering a bit from the fact that the former system, the one you called neoliberal that demonized public service and deified the markets, yeah. uh, even even before was not shared by the largest country in the world, which is China. 
not the largest economy. I think it's still the second largest economy. Yeah. But, the, but we have a clash between systems, a clash between philosophical systems, between the Western Cartesian Enlightenment and the uh, Chinese and Eastern philosophies. Yeah. And we have enormous pain and dysfunction. We have a place which in India is about 20% of the world's population and it uh, needs to have higher standards of living, but it can be at the margin. One of the greatest uh, either contributors to climate change or uh, dangers to yeah. sustainable climate change, depending on the path they choose and whether they get multilateral assistance. But in you're in my conversations prior to this conference, uh, this this podcast, we've talked a little bit about how the multilateral system needs itself maybe dying, needs to be resurrected, is caught in all of these cross currents. How are we going to bring global collaboration? Which I believe you tell me if you think otherwise. Yeah. I think is a necessary condition to achieve the goals the IPCC and others. Uh, have told us are necessary to our survival. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And and I would even say this is the main the main political and philosophical challenge we have to face in the next decades, which is on the one hand, you have to relocalize part of our production system, uh, which goes in the opposite direction of the globalization, you know, the way we have imp implemented it in the last 20 years. And at the same time, we have to improve considerably the type of cooperation among states that we can we can experience today. Um, in a situation where multilateralism, in the way we have constructed it in 1945 with the United Nations and the Bretton Woods Agreement, um, this is collapsing today. I mean, the United Nations um, uh, Security Council could not even make any declaration about the pandemic. And that's the first time since the Second World War that it's, we observe such a paralysis of this body. Um, the leadership of the U.S. is gone, as I said, and then we have to re reinvent a new, a new multilateralism in a in a situation where, as you just mentioned, we seem to have a big clash of of um, of civilizations. Well, China, India, and and Western countries, to to be very simplistic, or simplistic, it seems to me I, the way I would try to deal with it and to think about it is is the following. Um, um, it seems to me, if you think of the different categories of, of commodities and goods, namely private, public, commons, and there is a fourth one, which is tribal or network goods. Um, so economists used to think about it as, let's say, for instance, uh, an iPhone um, or Internet, Wikipedia. This is a, a, a network good in the sense that the, the more numerous people are connect, who are connected to this, the more valuable it is. But we could, you could also think about it as a tribal good. Um, which means that in order to, access, to have an access to it, you need to pay fees, you know, to pay some fees. And once you are in, in the tribe, then, then it's, it's a public good, but just for the tribe. So if you, if you have in mind these four categories, private, public, commons, and tribal, um, then we could say to a certain extent, this clash of civilization, if you want, um, means the following. Um, <clears throat> China actually never really invented the public instance. China never had the the what we had in in Western countries, namely the Gregorian Reformation in the 11th century, where actually the church invented for the first time the, the modern state, um, creating a law which was canon law at this time, creating a body of civil servants, namely the clergy, which was an international class of of, of civil servants, and so that I mean all the Western countries, including the U.S have to a certain extent just replicated what the church invented in the 11th century. What we have done in this, in this context is that we have formalized the public instance. Um, of course, at the same time, we had also the private, um, let's say, category, which never disappeared, uh, which was already there in the Roman Empire, namely private ownership, uh, and of course, the commons. And of course, the tribal also, which was present in Europe and, and in the US. But China, it seems to me, never had the public momentum, never had a state in the sense we understand it since, since the 11th century. Um, the, the main, the, the, the most important category in China, at least according to Confucianism, is, is the family. That is the tribe. It's a tribal category. 
And the, the, the reason I think for which it's so difficult for Chinese to think of a democratic state is that um, they don't have in their own culture, as far as I understand it, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist of China, of course, but the way I understand it, they don't have this uh, philosophical instance of a public body, uh, which would be the state in the way we understand it in, in Western countries. I would say the same story for, for India to a certain extent. So these are two big countries whose civilization is based on, on tribal concepts, namely, for instance, let's say the family in Confucianism, and which are in count, I mean, which are just meeting our own countries where we do have a public body, um, a private sector, commons, and also tribes. And then this is the place where it seems to me we could enter into a fruitful dialogue, trying to show to the Chinese, and I'm sure they can understand it, and they have already understood it, that having a, a legitimate, strong public sector uh, is efficient for everybody, even for the private sector. So it seems to me that's the big, the big challenge that we have to uh, to win in the coming decades in, in the dialogue we are we are having with China. Of course, in this big game, there is a, an actor which is, uh, to say the least, very ambivalent, namely, namely Russia. Russia knows something about what a state means, but at the same time, Russia is, is um, uh, I mean, embarked today, uh, thanks to Vladimir Putin, in a, in a pan-Slavic political program, which um, I'm afraid to say is not really, compa- not really compatible with any democratic effort that we could try to implement in Western countries. So uh, we've covered a lot of the issues that you uh, have illuminated it for our commission yeah. in light of the uh, in light of the pandemic, and and I find this very very nourishing. But this uh, global commission was looking at essentially the four we've called it the four sources of disruption, and then induced disruption, meaning technology, financialization, climate, and what we might call the uh, challenge to the nation state of globalization. And then finally, the induced disruption is migration. When things don't add up, people try to leave out of despair. And that itself is quite disruptive. How, uh, How do you think this commission that we're all co-architects of together should reorient its priorities in light of what we've learned and what we've discussed today? Well, I would say, you know, the four four main topics you were just mentioning are the right ones. I mean, are the most relevant ones. What I would say from my viewpoint is that um, I would personally try to emphasize something, I mean, a big research program to which I try to contribute, which, but of course, I'm not alone in this in this game, namely something like reconstructing macroeconomics towards um, what we could call an ecological post keynesian macroeconomic theory. Um, it, for, for, the, for the following reason, if you look at the, the mainstream macroeconomic theory, but that's true also of microeconomics, um, it, it deals with capital and labor and claims that we can produce wealth um, just with capital and labor, which is, of course, a nonsense. I mean, if you just think in terms of the first two laws of thermodynamics, we know that nothing can occur without energy. And we know that in the process of dissipating energy, the quality of energy is, is, is declining. That's the second law, I mean, the, the necessary growth of entropy. <clears throat> and once I had a discussion with um, with Valérie Masson-Delmotte, who is the the president of Group 1 in IPCC, that is the group which is dedicated to the physics of climate. And she, she asked me in a very provocative way, well, you economists, you're violating the first two laws of thermodynamics every day with your models, and, and you don't care. You can sleep peacefully. And um, well, I had to admit she was right. Um, and this is, this is one of the main reasons, I believe, why microeconomics is unable to deal with the big problems that are raised by climate change and the erosion of biodiversity. Simply because in most of our models, I mean, climate does not exist, nature does not exist, energy uh, plays a very minor role, and matter does not exist. So it seems to me what we have to do definitely is to to think of microeconomic theory as 
formalized through dynamical systems, because as I said earlier, I mean, equilibrium theory does not make sense. I mean, uh, there is no reason to believe that an economy is at equilibrium. And we have very, very good reasons to believe that it's not at equilibrium, but that it's, you know, wandering maybe towards an equilibrium, but then we have to study the conditions under which this equilibrium is locally stable or not, <clears throat> first. And second, to understand the impact of a number of physical constraints on, on microeconomic theory. To just give you an example, I mean, if you try to, try to understand why, since the, the, the second oil shock at the end of the 70s, and since actually the 1985, where the price of oil came back to the level it had before the first oil shock, Western countries never succeeded in getting back to the growth rate that we had during the 13 glorious years. Even though there was apparently no market constraint on, on the oil. Uh, and one explanation, one possible explanation is that we have reached the, the conventional peak oil in 2006 at the world level, as you know, um, with something like 98 billion um, barrels per day, um, which means that there is a, uh, I mean, the scarcity of oil extraction uh, might have been felt earlier, and why not in the 80s? So to a certain extent, it might be the case that the reason why we never had the kind of growth rate in Western countries that we had earlier, we have in every country at the same time an increase, a huge increase of both private and public debt and a huge increase of inequality. All these might be linked to the fact that there is a growing scarcity of oil extraction beginning in the 80s. Um, so that to a certain extent, we were, without knowing it, we were compensating the lack of, not the lack of oil, but the lack of the, the impossibility to accelerate the rate of oil extraction, we were compensating it by increasing debt uh, as a way to, to, feed, uh, to feed growth in our economies. Debt increase, of course, which feeds in turn um, financial bubbles, housing bubbles, and inequality. So this means that not taking into account the physical constraints that we are facing might be the big elephant in the room that we have totally ignored in microeconomic theory since since decades. So I would be uh, my my viewpoint is that what we should emphasize is this, especially because as you know in the in the near future there will be a number of of resources natural resources whose extraction might reach a peak. And so in my own research with uh, with physicists geophysicists, we have found for instance that copper might reach a worldwide peak in uh, in 2060. So, uh, and this would be very problematic because uh, we need a number of, uh, we need a lot of copper, especially for green infrastructures. And you know probably that green infrastructures need on average much more copper than infrastructures dedicated to uh, fossil fuels. So if we don't pay attention to the way we use copper today, if we don't organize recycling proced procedures, in a very efficient way, it might be the case that we will be running, not running out of, of copper because there will still be a lot of copper, but we won't be able to increase the quantity of copper we extract from, from Earth every year in a sufficient, a sufficiently rapid, rapid way so as to be able to implement the, the, the energy shift toward, uh, towards renewable energies, um, which would be very, very silly. So, so, yeah, I would say this, um, ecological um, <clears throat> um, post-Canadian macroeconomic theory would definitely be a huge research program that I would try to emphasize. I would add one word regarding climate. Um, within this research program, there is a big issue, which is how to understand the impact of, of climate change on, on our macroeconomic systems. As you know, there are some economists, I mean, mainstream economists like Bill Nodals, who keep repeating since 30 years that, well, we might have something like plus six degrees as an increase of our average temperature at the end of this century. And this would cost something like, you know, minus 10% of the world GDP, world real GDP. Well, this is that's ridiculous. If you think, if you talk with um, climatologists, I mean, they just, they just laugh when, when you tell them this story and they just say, you know, plus six degrees, that's, that's the end of the world to a certain extent. So, um, of course, there are some alternative damage functions 
uh, that are less ridiculous than the one that has been used by uh, by Mino, Bill Nordhaus. For instance, uh, Weizmann has an alternative function and, and Dietz and Stern, Nick Stern, also have alternative functions, which seem to me much more realistic. But we don't have a really, uh, I mean, convincing um, scholarly, I mean, founded debate on, on damage functions. So that actually we don't know how much it will cost us if we don't do anything uh, along the business as usual scenario, even on, on purely monetary terms. Um, and this is cumbersome because it prevents us from taking good and, and strong decisions today, just because we don't know. We are we are blind about the I mean the cost of not doing anything in the, in the near future. So there is a big research area here, which is to understand, I mean, to have more more realistic damage functions and to understand how much it will cost to us uh, not to do anything. Just as an as an illustration, with uh, with two colleagues of mine, uh, we have written a paper that we are going to publish now, which makes the following thought experiment. So we we take two of the probably most convincing damage functions that are used today in the literature, um, both by economists and, and climatologists, and we test them <clears throat> not on a global warming but a global cooling. So we make the the thought experiment. Let's suppose that we we face tomorrow morning. A minus four degrees cooling uh, on Earth, which would be exactly the, the, the reverse situation of the, the one we are going to experience in the, in the coming decades. Why minus four degrees? Because this is exactly the, the, the temperature of the last global glaciation that we had something like 20,000 years ago. And we have a lot of information about the way, I mean, the, the, about the, 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 the Earth. In, in this period, so that we know exactly how the Earth would look like if we were to experience some minus four degree cooling. So it's, there is no way to escape from that and to say, well, you know, there is some uncertainty about, about the impact of climate change. If we had this cooling, we would, know we would know exactly how this would look like. And actually half of Western countries would be just uh, under ice, under a big layer of, of one kilometer ice. So we know this would be certainly an, a, a huge collapse of, of the world economy. And nevertheless, the, the damage functions that we have tested claim that uh, growth at the world level would still, would still take place. I mean, GDP would still increase, which is ridiculous. So there definitely is an area of research, it seems to me, which consists in trying to have much more realistic damage functions. As I listen to you, I uh, recall a movie whose title was Six Degrees of Separation. And that title yeah. takes on a new likeness uh, Six degrees might separate us as human beings from planet Earth. And yeah. uh, I think this, uh, the urgency, I, I, it, there was a former, you probably knew, an Italian economy and finance minister, uh, Tommaso Patiasquilpa. Yeah, and sure. he, he, he gave the last speech at the very first INET conference in, uh, at King's College, Cambridge, in May of, or April of 2010. Yeah. And when he got done, and he, by the way, later codified this in writing in the Per Jacobson lecture for the IMF about uh, a month or two later. Mm -hmm. uh, and what Tommaso said was the challenge for INET was that there were three types of sustainability, yeah. financial, resource, and social, social, and that they would all interact and when he sat down, which he later elaborated in the Per Jacobson election, he sat next to me at the dinner. He sat down and he said, Robert, this conference will deal with financial sustainability that has been revealed not to be on track. Yeah. It will create a great deal of suspicion about the relationship, he said, between Croesus and the emperor, between government and the power of money. And yeah. this will sow the seeds of social discord and social distrust. And he said, and then with inequality and how inequality will be exacerbated by climate change. Yeah. Mankind will have its greatest tests and it will all ultimately focus on social sustainability because without social coherence, we cannot govern. And I remember just sitting with him at dinner feeling that scenario, that perception wash over me. And I recalled it today as you were talking about 
ecological macroeconomics in the, in the post-Keynesian realm because it seems as if, like you talked about with the physical constraints and so forth, that our macroeconomics presumes all those other sustainabilities are not in play, yeah, and yeah. particularly environmental resource sustainability. But I guess uh, you're in Dublin, yeah. And as I uh, as I listen to you today, I was reminded of a song that I've been very fond of by you too, mm-hmm. which was called "40." Comes from Psalm 40 from the Bible. Yeah. And the second verse, the lyric is, "He set my feet upon a rock and made my footsteps firm." Many will see, many will see and hear. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. How long to sing this song? Well, Gail, I think you from Dublin are singing a new song in economics and it's one that we must hear. And you're helping our global commission firm up our footsteps and to build a vision that we hope and believe that many will see and hear. Thank you for being my guest today. I I look forward to working with you and I look forward to having perhaps another chapter together. Any final thoughts? Mm, Thank you for for quoting the Psalm 40. You know, this Psalm was written by, by Jews, when they were in captivity in Babylon, in exile, actually. And so they were Mm -hmm. praying and saying, we are in a very complicated situation. Our country has been destroyed. The kingdom of David is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. Everything has been destroyed. But nevertheless, we have faith that uh, a future is possible. So it seems to me, yeah, we are getting close to the situation. And we need to keep faith. Yes. Well, the song by you two started... With I waited patiently for the Lord, he inclined and heard my cry. Exactly. He brought me up out of the pit, out of the mire and clay. I will sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. Gil, we'll have to get together again for another chapter of Economics and Beyond. Sure. But this has been delightful today, and I thank you again. Thank you. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.